couldn't be more excited to uh, bring you the creator of Samurai Jack, Dexter's Laboratory, with his new show, Primo, Gindy Tartakovsky. I am so excited to be here, and I kind of want to just gauge the room a little bit. Who here are Dexter's Laboratory fans? All right. Samurai Jack. Good. Star Wars Clone Wars. All right. Uh, Symbiotic Titan. All right, good. Well, this show is uh, something unique. Uh, I'm so excited making it. We're all excited making it. And it's a very different experience. We are doing 10 episodes, no dialogue. So it's the best of every sequence we've done in all the different shows, all kind of come up, kind of tied all together and giving you something hopefully kind of new. So sit back, relax. We're gonna show the first episode in its entirety. Then uh, we're going to come on stage. i got a couple of guests with me, and we're just going to talk about it and take some questions, and, uh, and then we'll be done. So that's it. So I'll see you guys in a little bit. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, i got a uh, couple of people with me. So first of all, I want to introduce uh, Scott Wills, who's a production designer. Scott, if you want to come up. Scott and I have been working uh, for a long time together, and uh, it's going to be the end soon, I feel. <laughs> and then uh, also we have uh, the music composer, Tyler Bates. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm so excited to show this because we've been working on it for a little while now and it's such a different show and it's, uh, you know, when there's no humor, it's always hard to sit with an audience because I'm just like, oh, nobody's liking it because it's so quiet. But it uh, sounds like hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And... It's, it's just the beginning where it goes from here is even crazier because basically they have to now live together and survive as kind of these two wild things and try to find their way through this uh, horrible primordial world. So the episodes are emotional and super action-y and horror and uh, it's coming out, um, like one of the things, surprising thing is how emotional it is, especially in later episodes, how the two have really bonded and it's a you know, man and animal relationship, but then so much more. But when we started doing this, like I, initially I started it as a, like, a, like a little kid on a little dinosaur, and it was more for like 6 to 11, and, and it kind of didn't feel right, and I started to mature, and then you know, I kind of put it away for a little while, and then I did, we did Samurai Jack the last season. <laughs> and of course, that was for Adult Swim, and it was, you know, it was, it was dark, and, uh, and we liked it. <laughs> it was nice to do things that's more mature because I always believe that I trust the audience and I want the audience to think. It's not just everything spelled out like, a, you know, like a, maybe a kid's show would be. Anyways, and then I started talking to Scott about it and we started talking about like how would we do color differently or what we would do. Right. Yeah, and I think we really wanted it to look like Frank Frazetta. If anyone knows who Frank Frazetta is, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like the god of animation art <laughs> or of, of uh, fantasy art. Fantasy art. So, um, yeah, and we thought, could we pull off a show that looked somewhat like that? Yeah, and I think it had, if it had the essence of what those fantasy yeah. illustrations would be. And we were both kind of 70s kids, so we like wizards and, uh, you know, heavy metal and all this kind of stuff. And it's all kind of seeped in, even some little, you know, Ralph Bakshi type yeah. things. But also we looked at a lot of 70s illustration for some of the, you know, the really vibrant uh, color and unique color. And, uh, and tried to put this show together. And, um, and then of course, you know, for music, you know, I've, big, you know, I've been a big fan of Tyler since always. And we got to work together on Symbionic Titan and then on Samurai Jack the last season. And so, uh, and so I approached Tyler to do the music. Sure, uh, Gandhi and I have been friends for a long time. I've been a big fan of his. And then actually I discovered his work after we became friends, like, you know, more intimately. <laughs> But uh, yeah, this is a, this is a tremendous uh, opportunity to work with such a pure artist. 
um, that is, is extremely rare, uh, especially as a composer. And before I continue, I just want to shout out to my composing partner, Joanne Higginbottom, who I'm sure is here. Uh, Who's, who's also, she also worked on, on Sam Jack. So, uh, and ma many of the things that we, we cook up at, at my place. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, what's really inspiring to a composer is when the dialogue between a composer and a director is finite. And when we're working on this show, this is, this is it. It stops with Gendy and uh, our initial spotting sessions, which we could talk about at some point during this, this discussion, <laughs> are really unique. But um, we know that at least the collaboration between us is exactly what we're talking about, as opposed to something that's subject to many shoes dropping later down the line. Yeah, and the and the, the process we have is very unique because uh, you know we've done TV for you know coming up on 25 years, if not more, and it's TV is frustrating because you know because of budget and, and schedule and our situation, just the way the TV is. You, you do all this front end, work, front end work, you basically get this blueprint together, and then you send it overseas, and then the next time you see it is it comes back full episode, and you're, my God, the horror of right. what it is. And it's always very uneven, and it's very hard, and so you, you wanna nurture, you wanna nurture something, you wanna really feel um, like you're not just packing this box and letting somebody else do the work, you want to do the work, at least that's how we feel about it, because we, we love working, I mean, this is why we're doing what we do, because we love it. And so, um, there was this little studio called Studio La Cachette in France, in Paris, and I liked some of their work, and so just on a whim, I emailed them, I said, you know, we're doing a, I'm gonna do a new show, do you guys want to do the animation? They agreed to do one episode, and then we started to see the work come back, and the way we work is basically, they would send us every scene every week, you know, so we get to see all the layouts, the animation, Scott gets to go over all the BG colors, and what that means, it's a more collaborative process, and we get to really nurture everything and, and, and make, it, make it very different and unique, and uh, for this show especially, where there is no dialogue, and, uh, you know, luckily, uh, you know, the folks at Adult Swim, you know, Mike Lazo, Keith Crawford, they really support us, and what I do is after we finish the storyboard, I'll, uh, I'll pitch it uh, and I record it just as the storyboards and I'll send it over for approval and it goes really well and it's, it's everything is very trust. It's really the best work experience <laughs> I've ever had. You know? And so with Scott, you know, we'll finish the storyboard, then I'll hand it to him. And we never talk about color so much, we just talk about emotion. Right. Mood, time of day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you always want something that uh, no one's ever seen before, which is pretty impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, we try to do, we follow the theory, I, I'm, I know I've spoken about it before, about no green grass or blue sky. You know, everything's got to have a point of view on it, and, and that's how kind of nature is. Like, there's always something specific to it. And, um, and so Scott would do his, his, he starts doing the backgrounds, I start putting all the boards together and doing the timing, and then we start this collaborative process with, uh, with the, with the French studio, and we went to visit them in January, and it was great, because they're all very young, you know, which is really awesome, because they're excited, they haven't been beaten down by the industry <laughs> yet, and they want to do something great, and it's kind of, it's the first time where I think, because I have a body of work, and that they actually know about it, versus kind of being a 25-year-old kid doing Dexter, where they were like, who is this idiot, <laughs> you know? And so it's been exciting for them, exciting for us, and we have this, this new, new feeling to the show, you know. And then once we get the show together, then uh, we take it to Tyler. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, Gendy comes over to the studio, and we small talk a bit, he and Joanne and I do. And then I'll look at him, I'm like, okay, are you ready? And he'll be like, yes, and then Joanne hits record. And then Gendy will walk us through the show. This is so normally you'd call this a spotting session. I guess it is, but he he beatboxes us in a way through the entirety of the show. He knows exactly where he wants music, exactly where there's not music, and that's a master of his craft, like completely understanding what it is we're creating. So it might start off with. Uh, <laughs> You know, and that's like, you know, the first 10 seconds of our, our spotting, and then it goes on. But um, it's really inspiring, 
and we're dealing mostly with with our internal discussion. There's no extraneous elements that we're referencing. It's really all about this conversation and building on the creativity that's been established from this show and our previous experiences. So it's really exciting. But that's kind of the not the process in a nutshell, but I know there's probably questions, so let's open it up to the floor and see what you guys want to talk about. Or nothing. Oh, there's people, okay, yeah. <laughs> no lack. No. Okay, cool. Um, just like to say that I love the holds in the animation. That was beautiful, cool. Um, and my question is that I know that animation totally has like a stigma of being like only for children, and I know that's been slowly dim like diminishing over time, but do you still kind of face that in your artistic community or just like when you're trying to pitch anything? Yes, for sure. It's still, um, there's still a, a thing where animations for kids, we're definitely getting a lot better, you know, especially because of Adult Swim, you know, Simpsons, obviously, all those shows have helped us along the way, but can we break it into features? You know, I think television's definitely opening up. And, um, and we'll see how the, what the future holds. You know, and for features, it's got to make money. That's, at the end of the day, that's what counts. And it's a business. And so, um, but I feel, like, I feel like America's ready. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and for me, Primal is the first big step towards that. And because uh, I think like on the big screen, in the theater, it could be amazing. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question was uh, just looking at the, uh, watching the episode, it made me think of uh, old pulp novels like uh, Conan, Tarzan. Uh, did that have any influence in making of Primal? Absolutely. I, I was a big Conan fan, and, uh, you know, of course, we all watched the movie, and I lived the first 30 minutes of the movie. And then... <laughs> I discovered the books very late, and when I read the books, I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. He's so much more of a character, and they were pulpy novels. That's what they were, and they were short stories, and I loved you just drop in, and it's him and some naked girl walking through the desert facing a monster, and I was like, that is so interesting and compelling. Can we make a show like that with that kind of story-inspired structure, and that's what our episodes are. You know, they're very, we just kind of drop in, and they're either fighting a thousand raptors or they're dealing with some kind of mastodon issue. But the big answer is, yeah, the, you know, Frank Frazetta, pulp novels, Conan, that was all huge in the inspiration. Thank you. Yes, good observation. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, going from writing for Samurai Jack to something without dialogue, do you find it harder to write the stories without without dialogue? dialogue not at all it's the most natural thing I do I think uh, because I'm an you know an immigrant <laughs> I'm a citizen but I, I did come to this country late you can leave uh, the control of the English language as you're probably aware of already isn't that spectacular uh, so I'm very comfortable with the visuals and that's you know by the way this is why we're in the industry because we want to do visual storytelling you know I love to escape and especially you know I love music and uh, sound effects, and to create a world with sound and visuals is incredible. And to transport you guys there, if it's successful, is, is really uh, what it's all about. So it's actually easier than dialogue in some weird way. Thank you. Uh, so my question was also a little bit about that choice to make it wordless. Um, Sean Tan's The Arrival is probably one of my favorite uh, graphic novels, and that's a wordless one. Um, so I'm just wondering, what was your uh, motivation behind making it wordless? I know you talked about the love of the visuals, um, but also, and how did you convince them to uh, let you make that bold choice? Well, the, the inspiration was, uh, it really kind of stemmed from when I mixed the episodes. Because when I mixed the episodes, we mix them for television, so you're, without getting too specific about it, you only have a certain number of channels where you can have music and effects and dialogue, and usually everybody wants, needs to hear the dialogue until the music and effects go down. And I'm like, oh, but I love that music cue, I want to hear it up. And so, through Samurai Jack, I started to really get rid of dialogue, even just grunting, because I always found that even when Jack goes, Ugh! 
it's got to be the loudest thing on the screen, even though there's this amazing music playing. And so I thought, well, maybe I could do a whole show like this. And there was zero convincing involved. I basically pitched the first storyboard to Mike Lazo, and he goes, man, this is great. Let's do it. And, 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 and that was it. So it was uh, very, very lucky. Hi. Um, there's so much emotion and so much grief that I felt by watching that. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about the decision to have something positive come from so much loss and so much grief. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess that's kind of life, you know, like we are all, all deal with, not get too deep <laughs> and emotional, <laughs> but we do, everybody has some kind of tragedy or grief or something and you gotta, you know, kind of move on and, and somehow find a way to deal with it. And I think, especially in this hardcore primordial world, and the thing about it is, is I didn't want to just do a violent show just because we can. You know, I still wanted it to have story and character and emotion because that actually heightens the violence, especially if you care for the characters, you know? So that's kind of part of our DNA. We never want to just do it, just violence for violence sake, because we can. Um, we want it to do uh, motivated. You know, you really want to have the emotions motivated and, and it's, uh, and you know, drama brings characters together. It's, you know, story rule number one. Thank you. I'll stay on the screen. All right. Hi. Um, uh, big fan of all, all you guys' work. I was kind of curious about the um, art direction in terms because it's looking more and more cinematic, even, uh, dare I say, more than on Jack. I was kind of curious, like, the influences that you guys had for it. Well, yeah, we mentioned Frazetta, but also Mobius is one of our favorites. And it's a uh, widescreen this time, even more so than Jack. Um, I don't know, I mean, visually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's to tell the story, to get, to suck out the most cinema out of TV that we can. And yeah, like in Jack, obviously we changed all the uh, screen ratios, but for this we decided we needed the biggest scope. And I think also one of the things that you're feeling is we have a new background designer, like the guy who draws in first before Scott does all the color, this guy Christian Schellwald. And he's an amazing this German madman artist and he does these incredible detailed drawings that are so lush and the, the compositions are very unique and they're very cinematic. So I think it's just natural. And that's one thing about, you know, I think all of our loves of 2D is you get to see his drawings on screen. You get to see Scott's paintings on screen, you know. And uh, I think it's part of that, um, that visceral reaction that you would have. And I think that's what all, the goal is to make it like a movie. You know, that's, we've always tried to do that ever, ever since Dexter. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Hello, uh, thank you for all the animation work you've done so far, like Dexter's Laboratory. It will always be nostalgic for me. So um, to the question, uh, will the time and setting of this current work be limiting to you since it's taking place prehistoric time? There's no technology, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's this, you know, obviously dinosaurs and man didn't exist, so we're already in a fantasy world. But it's primordial. We try to do, there's a lot of little nerd paleontology things that are actually accurate and interesting, especially once you go on through the series. And, of course, a lot of things, you know, dinosaurs didn't really act like dogs, so we've, we're aware of it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so we take our liberties and we stay faithful, but it's animation and it's what I want to do, and I can. <laughs> That's the great thing. So, uh, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My uh, question's for Tyler Bates. Um, so kind of following your work, I had a kind of question for this movie has no words. So when you're watching, norm like, some of the movies you've written, there are no, like, you listen to the dialogue and the music. For this, it feels like your music is pretty important to the story. Has that been a different experience for you? Well, it, obviously working with Gandhi is different than everything um, <laughs> in, in a great way uh, because he knows his storytelling so well that he's, he's comfortable embracing music and trusts us to, to you know, support the storytelling and emotion in the way that uh, he feels the music. 
should do so. Um, a lot of filmmakers don't truly understand how music impacts a scene. They know they need a bunch of it, but they don't necessarily understand the why of it. And that's exactly what Gendy brings to the table. So we're, we're able to really work on a, an elevated plane together creatively. Um, I don't get into the, the thought of that the music is more important because there's no dialogue versus something with tons of dialogue. You know, music is, is really, uh, if, it's, if it's present, it's a very important component to the storytelling and emotion of everything that we, we do. First off, I just want to say uh, thank you for basically making my childhood. Uh, me and my brother grew up on Samurai Jack, the Clone Wars. Oh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, I just want to uh, ask, what made you want to go in the more mature direction with blood and uh, adding more gore to Primal? Well, um, I think it's just kind of natural from Samurai Jack. I think that was the initial inspiration from doing the more adult version. And... Uh, also working with Mike Lazo because he gives me the utmost trust and support and he's a fan and he's the best boss you could have when it comes to that. And so I get to do what I want to do, which is very rare. And, uh, and yeah, and I think we want to tell more mature stories. And I think it just, I guess we've matured from doing, you know, thousands of hours of television. You're kind of moving on to whatever the next thing is before I'm out of date and then I can't get a job. So uh, we, you know, we want to strike while the iron is hot. I think I got that right. And uh, yeah, and it's really just the, the, it just all came together after Jack. You know, it was the right opportunity, the right timing, and we just went for it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, so I really love dinosaurs and it was really cool to kind of look like an allosaurus and a tyrannosaurus. So I was wondering uh, what other type of other prehistoric creatures do you have in mind showing uh, the rest of the season? Every single one. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do, we have a lot. We have some that we made up too, just to get a little more horror type scary stuff in. But there's a lot of dinosaurs and a lot of little creatures and some early prehistoric mammals too. So uh, it's, it's in there. Yeah. Don't miss an episode. <laughs> and I think the ticker just ran out, if I'm right. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, tonight, if, you're gonna, if, you guys, if you guys are going to go to the Adult Swim picnic area, there might be a little more primal surprise. So if you show up. Um, but that's it. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>